Oh, g'day champions. It's been a while, I know. Uh, Messer Boogie Mark II C Plus. This is one of the more uh, desirable messes. Not by me, but by others. <laughs> you know my opinions on Messer Boogie, but anyway. Uh, this one's been through three other techs, and the news is not fantastic. Now, this is becoming a very common story. Um, they just put their blinkers on, and... If you're the tech that worked on this, you'll recognise your own work, you know who you are, pick up your game, son. Uh, this amplifier is literally deadly at the moment. It will kill people if your, uh, your mains wiring is not in great condition. I'll show you why shortly. Uh, so this one came in for reports of, uh, well, it's been serviced by three other guys, as mentioned, and uh, it's got fluctuating levels of noise and hum. Um, so we'll, we'll investigate that. And just have a look at all the work and uh, see what can be improved, what can be cleaned up and uh, hopefully make this thing a, a bulletproof choo for a long time. So the front's in reasonable condition. It looks like it's had a proper gigging life, which is what you want. Uh, a little bit of damage to the to the uh, grill cloth there and the, the grill itself is starting to compress a little bit. Now you can see they jammed uh, the 12-inch driver in here because the early messes, or the early combos anyway, were... Uh, a sort of an offshoot of how he started making these amps, which is basically uh, just taking the guts of a um, Princeton and uh, putting uh, bigger transformers, uh, larger output valves, trying to get like you know 40, 50 watts out of them, 60 watts, and adding you know more gain stages, that kind of thing. Um, so as he started manufacturing his amps, uh, he had a similar mantra, I guess, and so that results in things like a 12-inch driver jammed into this cabinet to the point where the frame's almost touching the chassis in the bottom of the cabinet and as a result the grill is very thin in this area top and bottom so the grill cloth uh, tension tends to uh, collapse them in on themselves and there's not a lot you can really do about that you can make a new one but it'll probably just happen again but it's not too bad and uh, structurally it's fine so we'll just carry on all the original knobs are in place which is good to see yeah, you've got your push pull everything um, so one of the things that makes this the Mark II C Plus, I believe, is the pull deep switch. Normally that's a pull gain boost on the non-plus models. However, there was some crossover there uh, from from generation to generation and, uh, you know, throughout the years, uh, I guess, using up old face plates, the kind of thing you get with the, the early fenders and stuff too. There was sort of a bit of crossover when they'd change models. They'd use up some of the old parts, so uh, you'd have some strangeness happening there. you got some things like some... Looks like white out, little bit of dots of white paint there to show the show the uh, the user where their sweet spot is. So these uh, cascaded preamps with very basically you've got volume one, uh, master one, lead drive, lead master. So you've kind of got like four volume controls there in addition to the EQ and all the pull pull pots and whatever. Um, they are pretty easy to because all the gain structure is in the hands of the uh the user now it is pretty easy to make these sound bad uh but you know there is no such thing as a bad sound but just not what you'd expect for a you know a sort of traditional rock tone or metal tone or whatever um a lot of amplifiers will have a gain up front and then all the gain structuring between the gain at the front and the master is all sort of preset with attenuation. You've probably seen the 470K attenuators and whatever in your sort of standard Marshall circuits. Um, whereas all of that's adjustable. This is still have attenuation in the circuit, but there's a lot more control there. But with control comes great responsibility and great ability to make bad sounds. So this is, I guess, where the, uh, the, the folklore of like needing to know how to dial a messer in to get a good tone now in my opinion they kind of need the graphic eq uh for full-on higher gain like metal thrash tones uh you know modern metal tones because you need that sort of scoop um but for everything rock and roll um the mark one the mark two even the mark three i actually don't mind them i know mark my words today uh brad's guitar garage didn't shit on a messer <laughs> well at least not yet anyway you know there's still a good 15 minutes left of video so the first thing you notice when you pick one of these up is the weight my god man the weight and part of that's the monster transformers which is part of their tone very uh chunky power transformer and sort of output transformer you'd expect to see on well i mean they they say these are 60 60 watt amps in my experience they're a bit less than that but um with that large output transformer comes a a, a large uh bottom end cut off i guess you could say the smaller your transformer generally the more uh, restricted your, your your base frequencies are now it's got the world's longest uh speaker lead going down to the bottom there so it's got the mesa branded black shadow i'll 
look into who actually manufactured that because Black Shadow was a um, a brand that like Mesa would put on various uh, manufacturers OEM speakers that they they uh, commissioned. It's marked MS12, reportedly 150 watts power cap- uh, capacity. Doesn't say whether it's RMS or not, but looking at the size of that magnet, it's probably got a big ass coil in there, so I wouldn't doubt that. But 150 watts in a one by 12 with a cabinet this small, it's sort of <laughs> it's it's sort of fighting against itself a little bit. So um, yeah, personally, if I was to buy one of these, I'd probably get a head and a separate cab. But yeah, that's just me. We've got some very wobbly uh, 6L6s there. That's not great, particularly in a combo where they're going to be vibrating around with this friggin' 150 watt speaker right behind it. Even though this is a 60 watt amp, they did make a 100 watt version as well. Uh, this one may or may not have the holes. No, it doesn't. Some of them have holes with blanking plates. Uh, this one's just uh, the chassis is actually specially built for the uh, the 60 watt version. This is the international version with the uh, the crappy Fender style voltage selector switch. Uh, so I'll, I'll probably give the customer an option to bypass that and just hardwire it to 240 because those switches like to self-destruct under their own spring tension now here part of the mess of notoriety is the internet folklore and well you know their high class uh way of marking the different models so this one is reportedly a plus we can have a look at the circuit determine that for sure and see how the effects loop behaves is actually a sort of test you can do to determine whether you've got the plus model. A lot of people apparently think the any of the ones with the graphic EQ is just the plus inherently, but that's that's not true. It's to do with the uh, the circuit uh, topology and where the effects loop is. There's a lot of people that bleed mess a boogie and you know know every single screw difference on every single iteration, but I don't. I'm just here to fix them, bro. <laughs> so we'll have a look at the fuse. What do we got here? 1.5 amp slow blow, 1.5 amp for the exports. Uh, so yeah, we're on the highest voltage, so that'd be what we want. We've got a ground switch, which is not a good idea for reasons I'll show you shortly. Completely redundant with a three pin plug. There's absolutely no need for it. Got a slave output that I think they all have. This particular one's got a effects loop. I think the effects loop came in with the Mark II B or C. Uh, I'd have to check that again. There's a lot of people going to uh, correct me in the comments. I don't have time to research a lot of this stuff, but you know, maybe I should. <laughs> Presence on the back. This one does not have the reverb option. It's just got a blanking plug there. You got your three speaker jacks. World's most useless heat sink, and uh, the whole uh, chassis is suspension mounted with these um, little plastic plugs, which I'll show you in a second that have a rubber insert. Now, just to look at the plug. You can see a lot of damage on the tip of the plug there from arcing at some point. It's all pitted. It actually, it looks like the tip of the plug's actually melted, um, which I find it hard to believe that this amp would have done. Maybe that this amp, uh, this plug was repurposed off a, another bit of equipment, like a welder or something. Who knows? I don't like these plugs uh, because any any dickhead can get in there and wire them and bugger them up and you know have little pubes touching the other wires or uh, you know not do the screw up tight enough and they can pull out I, I prefer replacing the whole cord with a, a molded plug that no one can fuck with but um all of these uh at least have to be taken apart and inspected um if not replaced and you can see there this cable has the us uh wiring code so black for active white for neutral and uh green for for earth we've got brown for active blue for neutral and green and yellow for earth in Australia, I think that's uh, universal across most of Europe, but you know, don't know. Again, I should have done my research before I opened my mouth, but what's the fun in that? So a little look inside these plugs, it's just like a small uh, imperial screw there, but it's a plastic cup with a like a, met, a like a rubber disc in the bottom. And the previous text handily left a, a little piece of uh, off cut of wire in there for us. Maybe we can save that for our scrap metal pile. <laughs> uh, but the idea behind these, um, plugs is they sort of suspension mount the chassis now they kind of work until they don't and as far as i know uh you can't get these parts aftermarket at least uh not quickly or reasonably priced i'm not even sure if they'd supply them to the general public but yeah they do eventually uh screw up as the rubber gets hard and cracks all right champions let's get this thing out of the cabinet and see what horrors lie within stuff that spins through other techs almost invariably has some 
pretty horrifying stuff in it, so let's see. Just be careful not to rip the foil as we take it out on the top of the cabinet. Put that aside. Just have a quick look inside the cabinet. You can see here the little rubber gland things that suspend the uh, chassis. Shock, shock absorbing. Uh, they've got a pressed metal plate on the bottom that holds that uh, washer captive, which has actually got a like a sleeve, a metal sleeve in it that the screw engages with. They're yeah, pretty good, but the the rubber, it's a good idea, but the rubber tends to go brittle after a while and eventually they fall out. Um, and I'm not sure that's available as a replacement part. You can see there, it's just screwed into the uh, the timber there. Large oversized hole and then just four screws, but that's, that's uh, more than adequate. The foil looks okay. No serious rips. The Tolex is peeling back a little, but that's almost always the case. We can stick that back down without too much trouble. It's got this funny arrangement up top there. It looks like solder braid. And um, some staples on it. I'm not sure that's stock or maybe they were trying to uh, still ground this because it's obviously isolated by the rubber. So this whole uh, pad here does sort of no shielding at all until it makes connection with the chassis. But even this wouldn't really work. It really needs like a spring, like a leaf leaf spring, which I think the more modern ones have, but they get ripped up when people pull them out as well. So once you've got the suspension mounting, it's kind of hard, unless they made that out of conductive rubber to have any shielding on the top. This is probably actually going to work like an antenna more than anything else. Uh, it's not actually going to ground anything unless you mount a separate ground wire going from the chassis to this. You can see your standard sort of peelbacks there from the chassis being shoved in in the past. So we can uh, remove that staple, glue that back down and maybe re-staple it as well. That's probably the case on the top end as well. I just noticed the, uh, the pliers sl slowly delaminating in a few spots. Not Nothing too dramatic, but if it was any worse, we could probably squeeze some glue in there and clamp that down and leave it overnight. But it's probably been like that since factory, I think. Uh, I'll have a look at the rest up close and see if it's happening anywhere else. And if, if it is, we might glue that back down to prevent it spreading besides that the basket looks in good nick that looks like rust but it's actually just dust so we can uh, carefully clean that off looks like almost um like desert dust like really fine silt uh, so we'll vacuum off what we can and then slightly damp rag to get off the rest all right there she is uh looks pretty neat and tidy a little bit of surface corrosion there this is that zinc chromate coating that you see on a lot of stuff in the era it's kind of disappeared a lot these days i think they use uh, zinc anneal or zinc alum or whatever it is that that sort of uh matte gray looking stuff you see on all the modern marshals because uh, it's a bit of a cheaper and less toxic process i think from memory this is the stuff that like the aaron brockovich movie was all about the hex hexavalent chromium was used in the plating process so they've discontinued it now and used some other process you can get still the yellow zinc chromate or whatever it is but they use some other some other precursor but as as always the old stuff tends to be the more durable the, the most toxic stuff seems to be the best for the job well it's no wonder the 6l6s are wobbling around because uh someone squashed the valve retainers down so they're doing fuck all so let's just see uh how they go when we stretch them back up Bit, bit more tension required I don't think it's spring steel because spring steel generally would snap if you do that but so that, that's nice and sturdy now so I don't know what was stopping the previous guy from doing that especially in a combo where it's getting vibrated by that massive speaker right next to it so that's a lot better so this is a bit concerning looking down inside there I can see the uh, well these are the sockets where the the actual pin contacts about four millimeters down inside which isn't fantastic it's good from a safety point of view but um it only hangs on to like the very end of the the pin not very reliable uh but there's a layer of like rust uh not on that actual metal but like rust dust on everything like like uh it looks like rust and just looking around the outside of the sockets i'm hoping there's not been some kind of like large scale fluid spill inside the uh the amp because changing these sockets would get uh rather annoying and uh therefore costly the other thing that makes me a bit suspicious of that is things like this where around openings in the chassis there's just 
a large amount of uh, rust on the both the, the washer and the chassis, so we'll flip it over and have a look. But you can see here the uh, options for the, the reverb that aren't used in this one and the extra valve socket, the extra novel socket uh, space over here for the, the reverb tank driver. And uh, I'd imagine the, the transformer would go on, uh, probably mounted on these two holes here for the, the fender style uh, reverb drive with the transformer. So all these noble sockets are the bayonet type that's supposed to have a cover, but that's that's long gone. You often get that, previous techs just misplaced them or, you know, I, I doubt they're starting a business stealing old, old valve covers and <laughs> selling them on. I think it's probably more uh, just they misplaced them or just forgot about them when they put them back together. Don't assign malice to that which can be adequately explained by incompetence. What is that? Cunningham's law? Something like that. I don't know. Well, they've used oversized washers on the output transformer, and that's good. That's what I'd do. Just distributes the load over a larger area. It's a pretty thick chassis. I think it's 1.2 mil, probably mild steel. Uh, so pretty sturdy. One funny thing you see on the earlier Mesa Boogies is the chokes kicked over on an angle. Uh, when they come from the factory, they jam, a, they jam a wedge of timber in there. And, you know, that sort of works for a bit, but with the vibration and rocking the thing around, eventually the, the uh, frame just becomes fatigued and the bit of wood falls out and it's just a chunk of wood floating around in your cabinet. So you wonder what that is and it falls out in your car and then you pick it up out of your boot and wonder what it came off. And, and in the meantime, uh, they could have just used the same washers they used over here and uh, solve the problem, you know, a bit more professionally instead of jamming a chunk of lumber in there. So just having a look at the preamp valves. We've got a... Kelmer valve? CVC. ECC 83, 12AX7. We've got a Ruby 12AX7. Another one of those C CVCs, whatever they are. Never heard of them. And... Unmarked. Yeah, no etching on that at all. But they're all supposed to be 12AX7s in this in this uh, amplifier. Looking at the sockets, a little bit of surface corrosion on those pins. Um, I think they should clean up all right, though. Luckily, no Vaseline smeared on this one, which some local fuckwit likes doing that we see on many amps that come here. You've got to clean it all off with solvent, and you shouldn't put any gel or anything on these because what happens is they, it collects dust and then becomes conductive. You get flash over. And then you get tracking and all sorts of problems with the valve socket. So just clean them with alcohol and leave it at that. If it needs any more than that, you've got to replace the socket. Sorry. I guess this is an inspection mark, but, you know, that's my bloody birthday. April 84. And WB and I'm BW. So, yeah. And you can see down here the rectangular thing that's normally the courtesy outlet for our 120 volts or 117 or whatever it is uh, that they normally use for the fan. Uh, in the in the com in the head versions, in this case, it's just been left blank. All right, let's get these valves out of the way so we don't hurt them. Pins look alright if a little bit dull. We'll flip this over and check out the horrors that lie within. Ah, straight away I'm seeing stuff left, right, and centre. Ah, it's always a way, isn't it? All right, so starting from the back left, you can see the. Uh, the world's most useless heat sink. <laughs> does sound nice though when you do that. It's kind of fun to do if you've got ADHD. Uh, <laughs> it does nothing. They, they even use a uh, heat sink compound on it, which makes it even funnier. It's become a bit of a joke between techs, the, the useless heat sink. Um, makes it from the back look like it means business and you open it up and there's just nothing in there. It's like those empty Marshall stacks that were on the bloody Motley Crew stage or whatever. Right, so overall, these ones are pretty good to work on, um, providing they haven't been abused. It's really weird. It's like up till Mark II, they're just like, let's let's make it really easy for text to work on. Um, let's design it so service is like quick and efficient and, uh, you know, doesn't make you throw the spanner at the wall. And then from Mark III on, they're like, okay, that was too easy. Let's make it incredibly difficult and annoying to service for no good reason. Because um, <laughs> on this, you've got like, you know, you've got some tax soldering and stuff going on, which isn't great, but you've basically got all the components accessible from the top, uh, all the solder joints accessible from the top, which is kind of a dream situation. Um, you've got a lot of sort of uh, just hand-wired stuff going from board to board. Um, so this was like pre 
them using connectors uh, like molex connectors for everything which become often you know uh sources of uh intermittency or like burn connectors on the heaters we've all seen that in the mark series and later mark series uh where mesa boogie expect a one amp connector to take like five amps and of course it you know sets fire to the connector so i don't know what happened maybe a tech pissed him off at some point and he thought well screw that guy i'm gonna make it hard for all techs but <laughs> i don't know mate Is anyone's guess so literally the first thing i noticed when i took it out of the cabinet was this this cracked solder joint here now that's a heater connection so that explains the fluctuation in the hum levels whereas it's still maintaining output so that would obviously cause this one 6l6 to uh stop conducting completely uh but the other one would still conduct and still you'd get some signal on the output it would be a pretty lopsided signal but signal nonetheless it would make sound but what you'd get is you'd lose the uh common mode hum rejection of the uh, power supply ripple um, when only one of the valves is conducting so that would explain the fluctuating hum um, and they probably stopped playing it when that hum occurred uh, and didn't notice actually that it sounded weird as well um, so yeah often amplifiers don't get brought here unless they stop making noise completely or some some strange other noise starts occurring. If it, if they just start sounding a bit weird, it's pretty pretty rare that people bring them in. They just keep running them until they completely give up the ghost. But it's good to see this because that means that explains one of our symptoms. And mind you, it was brought into the previous three techs, I might add, for the same uh, symptom, and none of them got to the bottom of it. Uh, this looks like it's been here for a long time, and uh, that looks like the factory solder connection. Um, and none of them have found it so then it was literally the first thing i saw when i slid it out of the box so i don't know these other guys have got to pull their finger out of their ass and actually pay attention to their job that'd be nice wouldn't it instead of just charging people hundreds and hundreds of dollars and not fixing the problem and then just shrugging when they come back with the thing so seems to be the standard of service in sydney these days though unfortunately now this is something they used to do which is good that they don't do anymore for some reason flyback diodes on the output valve so Essentially what happens when you've got no secondary load on the uh, output transformer, so say uh, your speaker cable's failed, your speaker's actually blown, the jack's funky, or you just forget to plug it in, whatever. Um, what happens is the well, in, an inductor, which basically the output transformer is as well as the transformer, uh, an inductor tries to maintain the same amount of current uh, and will fluctuate the voltage to, to try and maintain that same amount of current. So when you've got an open circuit, uh, it tries to make the current, it tries to divide by zero, essentially, and and tries to maintain uh, that same current by making the voltage go up. And when you've got an open circuit, so effectively infinite ohms, it tries to make infinite volts to maintain that same current. And obviously it can't do that, but in the process it gets to several thousand volts, enough to arc over uh, nearby connections, like you've probably seen arcing on the circuit board, usually between the plate and the heater here, because the heater's pretty close to uh, ground uh, reference. Uh, so that's the shortest path, and it, it's it got the nearest path uh, is the plate, uh, is the screen grid, and that's often, uh, you know, pretty close to the plate voltage so the next best place is jumps over to pin two and you'll often see an arc between uh, pin three and pin two on octal sockets uh, the other thing that can happen is uh, it can arc over in the actual base of the valve uh, so the phenolic base uh, will will get what we call tracking within it which is where uh, it basically carbonizes a path through the center of the plastic and that becomes like a carbon composition resistor from that point forwards and uh, you're always going to have some kind of conductivity or arcing flashing over occurring there uh, so you really you need to replace the valve in that case or in the case of arcing through the actual valve socket itself you need to replace the socket now, i've seen people try and dig it out but it just keeps coming back because it's well within the guts of the plastic so replacing the socket is the best way to fix that uh, best way to fix stop it from occurring at all is put these um, flyback diodes in place now if they do they do cop it when that happens like they cop it pretty hard um, so is your mum, um, but they go short circuit. If they do fail, they go short circuit, sort of like an anti fuse, and um, that will blow the HT fuse if it's got it, or in this case, the uh, the amps main fuse. But what it won't do is destroy your transformer's insulation, uh, requiring replacement of the transformer, either the power or the output or both, because they're both connected to the B plus. 
or you know damage your valves damage your sockets require a fair bit of labor to replace all that stuff so it's a lot easier to replace a two dollar diode a one dollar fuse than it is to do all that so good little insurance policy i wish they still kept them in now we've got our carbon comp screen grid resistors there which often go high let's measure them 475 that's that's actually uh within tolerance wow normally they're up around five six hundred ohms by the time they get to me i've seen them as high as 750 just from uh degradation just check those grid stop as well here 2.2 .2, yep 2.2 .2, sweet as bro i'll check the diodes i have had it up and running just to confirm the um issues but we'll check the diodes while we're there all right so the biggest issue with this amplifier is uh what you're looking at right now which is the def cap you've probably heard of this thing down here so it's a capacitor that's placed uh, between one of the mains lines and ground. Now, its job is from back in the day when you'd had your unpolarized two-pin plugs, like in the US. These days, I think one pin's bigger than the other, uh, so it only goes in one way. And we've got our polarized plug there with the angled pins there, so it only goes in one way, even on the two-pin version. But back in the day, you could put the plug in, it was a 50-50 chance which way it went in the wall. So back in the day, you plug your cord in one way, it was noisy, you turn it around the other way, plug it in, it wasn't noisy because uh, that was tied, the suppression cap was tied to one of the lines to ground, so it would shunt that noise to ground. In this one, uh, they've got a polarised plug, but they've got a switch to switch between your two lines. Now, this is completely redundant when you've got a polarised plug and when you've got a ground pin, when you've got a three pin plug. Completely useless. Uh, I don't know why they installed it on this one. Um, maybe this was meant for the US or the international market and uh, just whether or not they had a different transformer in there, I don't know. Uh, makes no sense to have it. Now, bear in mind, this cap down here is called a death cap for a reason. This is not a safety rated cap. This is just a standard orange drop that's meant for signal like the rest of uh, the amplifier. It's not rated for AC, it's rated for DC. It's not self-healing. So that has actually gone short circuit, dead short. So with a switch in the center position, tied to ground, I'm measuring literally 0.1 ohms. Hard short in that cap. So if you flicked it that way, it would tie the neutral to ground, you'd probably get earth leakage and it would cut out on your earth leakage detector. Uh, if you click it that way, it goes from active, hard, short to ground. Now, that's assuming that all your wiring in your house, your cord, your plug and everything's good, your ground connection in here is good. Uh, if one of those isn't, what you'll have then is an energized chassis at 240 volts, so a death machine. And what's that chassis connected to? It's connected to your guitar hardware via the guitar cord. So if you were playing that guitar and you weren't touching anything, you'd probably be fine as soon as you walk up to touch the microphone, which is grounded to another circuit, probably on a mixer, which is probably actually compliant because it's probably built by a competent company instead of Mesa Boogie. Um, you would get 240 volts straight to the face. And uh, what would happen then is anyone's guess. But it wouldn't be good. We know that much. So just bear in mind, this has been through three other techs and none of them thought to measure this and none of them thought to remove it. They, you remove these on site. All right, so I don't know what these guys are doing. Have they got their blinkers on? Are they intentionally ignoring stuff? Uh, I don't know. But if you're watching this and you're the bloke who did it, fucking pick up your game or quit completely. Because uh, if you didn't pick this up, you're beyond it. You shouldn't be working on people's shit. Original or not, originality in a circuit, I don't care. If one of these is coming to my bench, it's getting cut out no matter what. No matter what the customer says, if they don't want me to do it, I'm not even opening their amp. They can take it somewhere else because I'm not being liable for it. So we'll cut that out before we can even test this thing. Uh, with it in its center position, uh, it's it's essentially out of circuit, but still, um, yeah, it's as soon as you click that over that way, it's hard short from uh, active to ground, and then here my earth leakage detector kicks in in a matter of you know uh, milliseconds, but some older houses, some older venues may not even have one. So... Uh, not something you want to be taking chances on. We'll take that out. We'll disconnect all of this. We'll disconnect that switch completely. And we'll... I was discussing with the um, customer, since it's right next to the phase inverter, it's a good little spot to implement a negative feedback option switch. So maybe no negative feedback in the center, maybe 50% one way and the full the full stock circuit the other way. Uh, makes it a nice little useful feature on the back there. And the other thing that's non-compliant, not legal in Australia, is... Uh, the neutrals fused not the active so just looking at the circuit the active comes in on this cord here and then it's coupled to this black wire which finds its way back to the front power switch which then returns 
uh, back to the voltage selector switch and from the voltage selector switch it goes to the various taps on the transformer and from the transformer uh, it goes to the fuse ring and then to the tip to neutral so that's our current circuit what we will do is we'll change the neutral to the voltage selector or disconnect it entirely and just hardwire it to 240 volts the active will come into the fuse tip the fuse ring will go to the power switch and then the power switch will go to the active on the transformer there's just no excuses for this stuff um yeah, I don't know. The mind boggles. Um, guys are really leaving themselves open here. This amplifier could have killed someone, and you'd have to try and live with that. I just don't understand why they take the risk. It's just laziness. So just carrying on to the rest of the work, we've got some Uvaco uh, caps in there. No biggie. I've used them before in a pinch, and they're fine, but the mounting of them leaves a lot to be desired. They're hanging off the edge of the board, which is just inexplicable. No silicon there. You've got some resistors hiding down there, in there, so that makes it a bit annoying. But you could have used some silicon or something. This is this is dodgy as. Uh, you're just asking for a fractured lead or fractured solder solder joint. These things are mounted uh, slightly better. The Sprague Adams, oversized silly things they are. Uh, so you know they're hanging over the board as well. Just a silly circuit board. It's undersized for any caps, and the caps they were putting on these things back in the day were even bigger than these ones. So why wouldn't you make the board a little bit bigger? There's nothing in the way. But, you know, trying to figure out mess of boogie's mind is a fool's errand. But then even the bias caps are hanging off to the side. At least they've got some silicon on them. I think they've been replaced in the past. Although they could be original. It looks like the, the usual uh, mess of boogie silicon smear there. It looks rather aged and yellowed. Um, but even they're hanging off the side, there's no need for that. Maybe they're, they're the original bias caps. If you're going to change anything, change the freaking bias caps, eh? Most critical two caps in the whole amp. Um, but they're like pushed over to the side from the previous caps, which were like even large diameter than these. Uh, so they're probably the stock ones and haven't been replaced. Here's a closer look at that area. We've got three, three resistors in uh, parallel here, which Mesa Boogie like to do quite a bit. Uh, that forms a dropper. And then you've got a single carbon comp dropper hanging off the board here uh, to avoid that nylon plug. So again, even even just the, the cap board's got some serious design fuckology happening. Oh, there's other, other resistors mounted under the board too. I only just spotted that then. So we might have to flip that and look at that work. Because now I've seen the other work in this. As always, I don't trust a single solar connection in this thing anymore after seeing the previous work done. But age-wise, these are, uh, what are we looking at? Uh, I think that's seventh week of 2019 date code there and uh, the evac code is anyone's guess because they don't put date codes on them which is part of the reason I don't I try not to use them um, I also asked them for a data sheet multiple times and they didn't want to give me one so I said that's fine I don't use caps that uh, don't have a data sheet for sorry bye so another thing I spotted uh, sort of while I was sliding it out was in a lot of places mess up we use this like solder braid shit for the ground connections and then they they wet it with solder for the whole length and what happens then is when you remove this board or remove these pots, you, you fracture the wire. And now that wire's frayed and it's touching other stuff and it's about to break. And that's the case for pretty much all the ground connections. They've all got a little kink in them uh, where the pot's been removed at some point in the past. And now it's like frayed and about to break in some spots. Uh, I don't know why they use this stuff. Um, I guess that way they don't have to worry about stripping wire. It's quicker, but it's just asking asking to touch other things, other components in the area. It's not a great way of doing business. And the whole board's covered with this, like, grime. I don't know what it is. It feels almost like it used to be a conformal coat because it's, like, crusty. Um, but now it's got shit all stuck to it. I don't know. Maybe a fire occurred in here or something. It's hard to tell, but I don't know what that shit is. I think it might be a... Someone sprayed a conformal coat on it at some point, but the solder connections are clear. Maybe it was from the factory. Uh, the solder connections have it as well. Could be a combination of what used to be a conformal coat. But yeah, to remove all that, you pretty much have to depopulate the board and, uh, you know, re fully rebuild the thing. So I think we'll have to brush off the excess, maybe try some alcohol on it, but that's about all we can do given the time frame and the, and the uh, budget. You can see there that that wire's got a big. It's about about to break off, thanks to um, being bent back and forwards when the th the wire's already tinned. You got some pretty sketchy installation of this caps on branded uh, 
filter cap there. It looks like they've used some silicon, but it hasn't taken. Could have been uh, grease or something on the on the cap when they've tried to stick it there. Normally, like I've I've tried to remove caps that I've silicon down, and sometimes like literally the jacket rips off with <laughs> with the silicon. So looks like someone's been down there and replaced a what is that one meg? So that'd be a uh, grid leak. Someone's replaced the grid leak. It looks out of place. You've got the tandem caps that love to go short circuit all the time without warning. Got some tax holder stuff there that doesn't look factory. That's only holding on by a couple of strands. You got stuff in midair. Connections, resistors, a little resistor tree here. I don't know if that's a mod. Don't know if it's from the factory or not. This is all unknown stuff that we don't have time to investigate too heavily. And you've got what we almost always have, just a layer of grease and oil on all the pots because people just spray the living fuck out of them. And whatever that oil is, is probably not suitable because it's gone hard. So imagine that inside your pot. It's turned into a, like a crusty, uh, like a, almost like a, imagine like a, a boiled linseed oil sort of texture with dust in it. So that's all over the pot wafers now because they've sprayed it inside the pot as well as out. All right, Mr. Previous Tech, can you explain what the fuck all this is? Look at this. Just, let's make a bus out of just random bits of wire and, yeah, shit just tacks hold and falls off. Ah, uh, man, I'm so sick of seeing this stuff. Uh, the worst thing is, I know the people that did this. Um, I know their names, and I don't want to say them. <laughs> but you got bits of mic wire in there, uh and just like is this do you see this and then go yep job done well or uh is it just a matter of get this thing off my bench as soon as possible i don't want to even think about it let alone uh put in any effort don't know it's really curious i just no pride in workmanship unfortunately so i don't know what the idea was over here or what happened um why have you got to have a shielded run for like an inch long wire um are they trying to chase oscillation uh, all the jacket on that wire is melted uh, looks like looks like an MEC pot so maybe the pot was uh, replaced but yeah pretty pretty shabby work in this area so we'll probably redo most of that so I know roughly what I gotta do basically a lot of cleaning um, so all of that rust on that chassis down there concerns me quite a bit because we really can't do anything about that without dismantling the whole thing which the budget and the time does not allow. Uh, down there is our main ground connection, which is also, uh, well, not the way you do a safety ground. Shouldn't be mounted to the transformer hardware. No ground should be mounted to the transformer hardware, but particularly not the safety ground. That should be mounted to a dedicated bolt right next to the mains entry. So we'll have to do that. Uh, that ground I don't trust at all, so we'll have to clean up the chassis in that area. And um, I don't know seal the metal somehow and then still get a reliable ground connection just a lot of rust there a lot of pitting almost looks like someone's had a go at cleaning it up in the past too without getting right in there once you've exposed the base metal uh, you really have to clean it and refinish it somehow whether it's a clear lacquer or replated or paint um, but there's no point exposing bare steel and then just leaving it because it'll uh, it'll just go the same way again so I guess I'll get to work on uh, stripping down the areas I'm going to redo and um, flip that power supply board, have a look at it, go through and start uh, touching up solder connections and uh, testing other components for drift, replacing the remaining uh, electrolytics that haven't been previously changed or changed with shitty versions or replaced poorly. We'll replace the uh, tantalums because they love to go short circuits. We'll replace a lot of that wiring, the frayed wiring up the front. I'll probably use some multi-stranded uh, Teflon jacketed stuff for that. We'll redo that input area and the first pot there because that's terrible work. Redo all the uh, mains stuff down there, get rid of that cap, start looking at uh, doing the negative feedback mod with the ground switch. Uh, see what we can do about the rust. Probably not a hell of a lot, but we'll just uh, clean up the areas that we, we require to get a reliable ground connection. All right, so we'll just see with some alcohol and a cotton bud what what this stuff on the chassis is you can see this like little what 10 millimeter square area 
It is getting off, but look how dirty it is just from that. Uh, I don't know what happens to these amps. They just end up full of crud. And you sort of, you have to either pull a thing right apart and fully clean it, or just, you've got no choice but to ignore it, and it sucks. I really want to clean hell out of this thing, but uh, I think it's a bit beyond it. Just a little test on the board as well. It is coming off, whatever it is. It's leaving, you know, the tin's a bit corroded underneath it. So that's what makes me think it wasn't from the factory. That tiny little spot, and look at the, look at the cotton bud. You'd have to fully rip this thing down and scrub the board and reassemble the whole lot to get to it, so... Not happening in this case, unfortunately. Alright, so solve the mystery as to why the caps are over to one side. It's because, uh... Old Art and Engineering threw the screw right through the centre of them, didn't he? He could have just moved it over half an inch or an inch. And, uh, would have missed them entirely in that case, but, yeah. Like, look right there, but he's combined it with a ground connection, even though it's a plastic standoff so that doesn't make sense at all uh yeah put the hole there put your standoff there problem solved but yeah now we've got to work around the um, art and the engineering anyway we've got the board out we can see the extent of the rust is significant so i don't trust this ground over here as far as i can throw it uh so we're gonna have to find a better way of grounding stuff it shouldn't be mounted to the transformer hardware anyway and same goes over here so We'll try and find an existing hole that we can use that's unused. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to drill a drill a hole uh, to to get it safe and reliable. We could solder to the chassis too, but we'd have to clean clean off an area because we ain't soldering soldering through that stuff. Now I've removed the cap board and everything. We can see uh, next to that uh, transformer mounting bolt is actually a convenient three mil hole. Uh, so I'll m clean up that area and mount an eyelet. It's a little bit less corroded over there than it is where the transformer bolt is. Uh, and then we'll refix the transformer and we'll connect, uh, well, probably the center taps and everything uh, to that point. And that can be the power ground. And I was just touching up the uh, solder connections here to this, this preamp valve and Notice that as well. So that couldn't have been good. Yeah, little little hidden gems everywhere. Well, champions, we've dropped the transform. Well, you haven't. I have dropped the transformer out. Uh, cleaned up the rust as best we can. It's still pretty bad, but um, I put some uh, paste wax over that to sort of seal it as best we can. It really needs full stripping and neutralization and replating, but that's totally not in the budget. It'd probably approach about half the the value of the amp um we've cleaned up the output uh pcb rather well that came up rather well we reflowed uh removed all the solder and applied new solder and then cleaned off all the flux uh for the output valves there anywhere there was a connection through that rust i've actually got the dremel out and freshened up a bit of that steel uh, and I found another little hole down there, so that'll be our mains connection uh, for the safety ground, and that'll be our uh, center tap for the HT and the uh, ground a little, little bit ground terminal for the uh, bias supply as well. Now that conformal coat stuff that was all cracked and caked with dust and schmoo, uh, that actually came off with alcohol reasonably well, so that's good. Uh, the preamp board looks a lot neater and tidier. I've reflowed the valve uh, pins as well. I'm yet to replace those. Uh, this is sort of halfway through. I'm bit, uh, yet to replace those uh, tantalums down there and that one up in the air uh, and have a closer look at the, uh, the circuit and what's been changed and check the values are good. And speaking of values, I was uh, halfway through depopulating and just cleaning up the power supply board and securing the caps properly with silicon instead of this weird foam bits of tape left, right and center. And I was going to mount the uh, the balance resistors on the bottom side so then we can silicon uh, the, the stuff, uh, the, those two caps together after putting the screw in. It's a bit annoying that the screw is there but there's not a lot we can do about that now. When I noticed that the uh, the four resistors, they were 22k each, coming to a total of 5.5k and the schematic says 5.6 um there are actually extra holes drilled by by the previous person so one two three four extra holes and there was another resistor on the back that was tacked together originally this just had that hole that hole that hole that hole that hole so the cap goes in there the cap goes in there this is the dropper resistor for those two nodes and that's a dropper resistor for the next node over here so 
the weirdness with the paralleled resistors was literally they got the drill out and drilled extra holes in the PCB because they could not be fucked ordering the correct resistor. So there you go. We'll put a 5.6K in there. I've got some nice 3 watt V-shays and then a 1K in there as per the schematic. Uh, and we'll forget about these extra holes. So clean up this flux. Put a bit of silicon on the board, reinstall the caps. Focus, punny boy. Come on. you got one job, champion. Your days are numbered. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then we'll get that power supply board back in and uh, we'll continue to recap the bottom board down there. You can see where I've removed the uh, the poorly mounted cheapo caps on, filter caps over there. And uh, we'll put some nice Nishikons in there, uh, 105 degree rated. Which brings me to another thing. I don't know what the go is with these, but... 65 degree rating is pretty pitiful for a valve amp. Like 65 degrees, like that's the like probably the temperature of the chassis uh, after running it for like I don't know less than an hour. So um, 65 is really lame. All the caps that I use these days are 125 if they're anywhere near the power supply or near the output stage. 125 degree rated, uh, and usually eight to twelve thousand hours. Um, so yeah, uh, these are just overpriced little little uh, pretty goo guards it's like a fake pearl necklace you know let's not talk about pearl necklaces anyway moving on 